But I'd like to talk about our country a little bit. Uh, we've been through a lot of wars. Anybody here? Uh, how many veterans do we have here? Thank you for your service. Thank you very much for your service. I got to be one of those also. I got to be a proud member of that unique group called the United States Marine Corps. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> But our country's been in a lot of physical wars. We've won some, and unfortunately, we've lost a couple. But we survived them. Thank God we survived them, and he blessed this country. But today, our country's in the greatest war we have ever been in. It's not a war being fought with guns and bombs. It is a war of worldviews. It is a war for the very heart and soul of this nation. And today, Christianity is under the greatest attack it's ever been in this country. And unfortunately, most churches don't even know we're in a war. And our Christian universities don't even have a clue we're in a war. They're doing the same thing they've always done, not preparing our students for the battlefield. So I want to help prepare you a little bit today. I'm going to help you, if you're not already there, be obedient to God's word. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement. Yes. So I find a lot of Christians aren't being obedient to God's word because in his word, it commands us. Notice that word, it commands us to have a ready answer always for the hope that we have. 1 Peter 3, 15. Jude 3. There's only one chapter, so we don't have to worry. It tells us to contend for the faith. That word contend is where we get our word agonize. We're not supposed to take this lightly. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 is commands us to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In the book of Titus, it says, if you're going to be an elder in a church, you're supposed to learn how to defend your faith. Ephesians chapter 6, three times it says, stand firm. So the Bible tells us, every Christian, we need to learn how to have answers for the hope that we have. This is not just to understand it. We're supposed to put it into practice. So I want to be here today to answer some of the toughest questions we have against Christianity and even the creation movement, some of the hardest ones we have. And I'm going to show you a tactic here. I love tactics, I love strategy, and I love covert operations. I was well-trained in all of those. Matter of fact, I like to start my talks off. I was trained to do two things, shoot people and blow them up. How many wish you hadn't come now? <laughs> I love to tell pilots, one of my jobs in the Marine Corps was shooting down airplanes with missiles. We only shot the bad guys. But anyway, let's take a look at some answers for non-believers. And our topics, we're going to take, start off with one of the most difficult ones, distant starlight. And then we're going to have, have scientists proven the Bible wrong? Is God evil because he killed men, women, and children? And finally, is the Bible outdated? A couple of these are the hardest challenges we have against Christians today. So, you, one thing I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to be a scientist to understand everything I'm going to talk about tonight. Because I'm going to show you the power of God's Word and how to use His Word. And show you, you don't have to be a philosopher, you don't have to high, have high degrees in religion, and you don't have to be a scientist to learn how to be an apologist. Does that make it easier? Right answer. Wrong answers. You know what Marines love to watch people do? Push-ups. So there'll be no wrong answers tonight. So let's take this challenge. Distant starlight. The non-believers will come up to us and say, Mike, how can you believe the Earth is only about 6,000 years old when we have the light from those distant galaxies out there that are millions of light years away and would take millions of years for that light to reach us? So the the earth cannot be only 6,000 years old, as the Bible clearly teaches. Now, how are we going to answer that challenge? Well, I've listened to all the scientific challenges. We have possible answers. That's all we have are possible answers. So here's the problem again. If the earth, the universe is only 6,000 years old, how could the light from distant galaxies, billions of light years away, have reached the earth? How do we answer that one? Well, let me give you a clue. We have an almighty God, don't we? See, we tend to diminish our God. We tend to think, well, if our scientists can't figure this out, then neither can God. But I want to show you who our God is today. Two issues. Number one, how to answer the believer. Because that's a limited question believers have. They like to know how to answer this thing. 
And after tonight, you will be held accountable for knowing how to answer it. I've got about five or six days in this area. And if I see you somewhere, walking on pavement, driving a car, I'm going to chase you down and answer this question, ask you this question. If you can't answer it, you immediately drop and do 20. I have one of the greatest techniques for teaching. It's called fear and intimidation. Works well. Then I'm going to show you how to answer the non-believer, even the astronomers, and without having an astronomy degree. So how do we answer the believer? Well, let me ask a question here. Do you believe a donkey could talk? Yes. 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 Numbers 22. A burning bush that's not consumed. Yes. Our God can do that. How about Jesus healing people instantly? Didn't have to wait for any recovery. No band-aids. The raising of Lazarus. Oh, I love that one. John 11. I love the King James Version. Because they, they tell Jesus, he's been dead for four days. By now, he stinketh. <laughs> but you know, Jesus did it instantly. Creating everything out of nothing. Raised his own son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. And then defied gravity when Jesus sent it back into heaven. Our God can do those things, can he? You know, if he can do those things, then what's the problem with this in Starlight? Where's the problem? Are you denying our God can do this? Folks, in Genesis chapter 1, he said he created everything in six days. You know, it actually says three times in the Old Testament, it says six days. Nowhere does it even imply millions of years. So where do you get this millions of years from? Not the Bible. It comes from the outside world influencing the church. I've debated people, I've talked to people, no one can defend a million-year-old earth using the Bible. They can't do it, as a matter of fact, they can't do it scientifically. So if God can grave anything on nothing, he can get that starlight here, folks, instantly. No problem. How he did it, we don't know. We weren't there, were we? But you know, the Bible also says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We better start having some faith in our God and start learning how to defend God's word so distance our life, not a problem. Now let's answer the non-believer. Well, there's three things we know about the non-believer they don't recognize. And this is where I start. All my debates, all my discussion with non-believers, we have an advantage. We know something about them. Number one, we know they know God exists. In Romans chapter one, it says, everybody knows God exists, including the most ardent atheists, they know. Even politicians know it. Yeah, that might be stretching, but they know. The other thing we know about them is God's moral law is written in everyone's heart. So they know that also. The other thing we know is that they willfully suppress the truth of God's word. So we start with the advantage right away, knowing something about them. So now, two things we, need, we know before we respond. Number one, we know those three facts, don't we? Number two... We really don't have to prove God's existence. You know how the Bible starts? Four words. In the beginning, God. What does that say right there? The Bible starts with the assumption that God exists. See, we don't have to prove it. The Bible already says it. Now, the question is, do you believe God's word? A lot of people don't want to believe God's word because that's too hard for them. But in the beginning, God tells us God existed before time. God existed before this material universe. Then it's followed by a pretty important verb there. In the beginning, God did what? Created, bara. He created everything out of nothing. What did he create out of nothing? The heavens and the earth. So that first verse in the Bible is a powerful verse. It says an awful lot who our God is. So how are we going to answer the non-believer? How about two-step response and we win? Does that sound good? I like easy things. See, what I'm trying to train you to do tonight is let's stay on our worldview. Let's not go over their world worldview. See, we want to get in all these scientific discussions, and there's nothing wrong with science. It is good. We can use it for bringing down strongholds. But in this case, we don't have to. I'm going to argue from my worldview, which is God's word. I'm not going to go into their worldview. So number one, without a creator God, nothing could exist. That's how I'm going to answer this. This and Starlight. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. My God says he created everything out of nothing. 
On day four, he created the stars, and he got that light to reach us. He can do that. Then after I make that statement, I'm going to say this to the unbeliever. Using only empirical science, that means observable and repeatable, can you demonstrate why anything at all exists? In other words, where did the matter come from to create your stars to form the light? How in the world are they going to answer that? Well, here's some of their possible responses. The Big Bang created the universe. No, it didn't, folks. Where did the Big Bang come from? Where did the matter come from to create the Big Bang? You cannot have something go bang until you have something there that can go bang. <laughs> Say, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm not asking about the Big Bang. I'm asking where did the original mass and energy come from? Here's another possible answer to you. Oh, I've had this in upper level physics classes. I've actually been invited in universities in upper level physics classes to talk about creation. And I knew what they wanted to do. They were just waiting to tear me apart, and I looked forward to that. <laughs> Why? Because I go into those meetings with a lot of prayer. I bathe myself in prayer because I don't want to be an embarrassment. But I don't care if they ridicule me. My job is to get the gospel to them. That's my job, and that's your job. Quantum fluctuation caused the universe to come into existence. And that's one of the professors told that to me. And I said, well, sir, that's interesting, but, but can I ask you a question? Does a quantum fluctuation require energy? He said, well, yes. You haven't told me where it came from. Where'd your energy come from? No quantum fluctuations without energy. So I had to back off of that one. He had no answer. The only other one they're coming up with now is nothing doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is incredible. If you if you don't accept the truth, folks, you're going to be willing to accept anything, and that's what they're doing now. Actually, PhD scientists are now saying nothing doesn't really mean nothing. I don't, even buy, don't, don't waste your time with that. Those are the only possible answers they can have. So ultimately, the only answer they have, folks, they have to accept the universe came to existence by faith. What have we just done now? I gave them a challenge. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. Then I challenge them, because I'm not going to let them off the hook. They challenge me. I have the right to challenge them back now. I'm not going to let them get off the hook as if they have an answer, because they do not have an answer to this. So ultimately, we both have to accept by faith, don't we? You know what my next thing is I'm going to tell them? I'm going to tell them what my faith has to offer me. You know what that means? I'm going right for the juggler. I'm giving them the gospel. That they're a sinner, and they need a savior. That's what they need to know, folks. They don't need to really know how the light got here. They need to know that they're a sinner and they need a savior, folks. Because they are doomed right now. They're on their way to hell. And we don't wish that on anybody. Not even our worst enemies do we wish that, folks. We're there to be evangelists. Apologetics and evangelism go hand in hand. They're not separate, folks. You can't just be an apologist without being an evangelist. So we need to know how to make this work. Powerful statement. We're going to use that one several times tonight. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. And that's true. So conclusion. The non-believer cannot account for the original matter that created the universe. Therefore, don't even talk to me about the stars and starlight. You don't have a starting point. The non-believer must ultimately rely on faith that somehow matter came into existence, which over time supposedly formed stars to make the light. It's all a faith issue, isn't it? See, so they're challenging us. We have the right to challenge them back. So, how was that? That wasn't too bad, was it? We didn't do one piece of quantum physics, did we? We didn't do anything about time dilation. We challenged them from our worldview. That's how we do it. Let's go to number two. Have scientists proven the Bible false? That's a quite, that challenge comes out quite often. The Bible's false. We've proven it false. Two questions you can ask before you get started. One of the things I like to point out is when you're in a discussion with somebody and they challenge you, don't immediately give information. Learn the tactic of asking questions. Clarification, clarification questions such as, what do you mean by, or very specific questions to help them clarify what they just said. In other words, don't go out putting information out first, because then you're putting something on the table, and if you put something on the table, then you have to be able to explain it, defend it. Let them put the information on the table, then you hold them accountable. That's how we're going to do this. 
We got to be smart about this. And we must understand that when an unbeliever challenges us, it's not just a challenge on a specific thing. It's a challenge about our worldview, folks. We're there to defend our worldview. You know the basic two tenets of our worldview, just to start with? God exists and His Word is true. If we don't believe that, folks, we don't have a biblical worldview. All of His words true, even the book of Numbers. Okay, two questions. What evidence are you using to prove the Bible false? Don't just start giving information. Let's see what they're using. Why do they believe it's false? Then we'll know better how to answer them. Or what do you mean by proven? Because in science, we don't like to use the word prove real often or facts. Because things are constantly changing. So I'd like to know what they mean by proven. And what are they using to prove the Bible wrong? So that will give me a better answer. When they say, when they, whatever they say now, now they've put something on the table, and I can challenge them based on their answer there. So, response. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. Therefore, God must exist. What a powerful statement that is. Then, in many places, the Bible teaches God created all things. You know, it's just not the book of Genesis that God created all things. This is just a small part of the number of books that teach God created all things. This rules out any possibility of evolutionism. The fact that God's the creator of all things. And how long did it take him to create? Well, that's easy. Read Genesis chapter 1. And I challenge people who want to believe in an old earth, Christians who want to believe in an old earth, read Genesis chapter 1 without adding anything to it. Just read it for what it has to say there. And then tell me what it says. And most all of them will say, well, it appears to say six days. You know what I find out? Most all the people I talk to that believe in old earth, Christians who believe in old earth, their starting point's not the Bible. Almost 100% of the time, it's their understanding of the science. Notice I said that, their understanding of the science, not the true science. In other words, we have a lot of people in church today who don't start with the Bible as their worldview. They start with their own wisdom as their worldview. Read the Bible, it says six days. No words that say millions of years. Well, Mike, that word day can have different meanings. I know that. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it does have different meanings. But they forget a basic rule of interpretation. It's called context. And the context in Genesis chapter 1 clearly says literal days. There's no way around that, folks. Next. As the creator of the universe, he gave us this book called the Bible so that we, we could know him, which includes how he created everything. Ooh, wow, that's one. Now, remember the question. Have scientists proven the Bible wrong? So I'm going, I'm going to give them information that shows the Bible's not wrong. We can trust it. How did God create? I know a lot of Christians and professors in Christian universities come up and say, well, the Bible doesn't say how God created. He could have used the Big Bang. You know what my answer to that is? Read the Bible. Because the Bible clearly states how God created in Genesis chapter 1, know what it says? And God said. Over and over again, it says he spoke it into existence. Psalm chapter 33, verses 6 and 9, what did it say? And he spoke and it came to be. Hebrews 11, 3 says he spoke it into existence. How many times does God have to tell us that he spoke the universe into existence by his great power? All he had to do was speak, and there it was. You know what? Our God can do that, can he? Let's stop trying to create God in our image. And let him be God. Then, we also believe the Bible and true science are not in conflict. Don't ever go out and say the Bible and science are against each other. No. Who created all the scientific principles? God did. He's not in a battle with himself. The problem here is it's a battle between God's word and evolution, and it's also a battle between true science and evolution. They do not agree. Finally, the Bible being the Word of God is our ultimate authority and source of the truth in all matters. John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed. And all of it is useful for teaching and rebuking. So the Bible clearly teaches God is the creator of all things and His word is true. Then... This includes a perfect creation by God. Remember, I'm still trying to explain this thing. 
is the Bible outdated? And I'm going to take my merry little time. I'm not going to try and answer it in about a minute. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to answer this thing. Why? Because I know what they need, and I want to make sure that they hear what they need. And what do they need to hear? They're a sinner, and they need a Savior. They don't need to hear my wisdom. They need to hear God's Word. So this includes a perfect creation by God, the fall, man's act of disobedience and sin, and God's love for us by offering to pay the penalty for our disobedience through His Son, Jesus Christ. And then, now, using empirical science, again, that's observable and repeatable, could you help me understand why I'm wrong to believe the Bible is correct and evolution is false? Now, they have to put something on the table, don't they? And whatever they put on the table, I can challenge now. See, the idea here is, I'm going to give an answer here. Then I'm going to turn this thing around and put them on the defense. I want to see if they have answers to hope they have. And I found a lot of times, all they're doing is mimicking something they've heard. Don't be afraid to do this, folks. If, you, if they come up with something and you can't explain it, you've done your job, haven't you? At this point, you've done your job because what have you done? You've given them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because where's the power? Romans 1, 16 says what? The power is in what? The gospel, not our wisdom. So what if they don't like your answer and walk away? Paul in Acts 26 comes before King Agrippa and Festus. Festus being one of those Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. And they challenge Paul in the resurrection. You know what Paul does? He doesn't appeal to a single bit of evidence. He goes by what the principle called possibilities. He says, well, my God's the creator. Therefore, he can raise people from the dead. You know what uh, King Agrippa did? They thought Paul was crazy. And that's where it kind of ends. Paul did what he was supposed to do, didn't he? He got the word of God in there. Don't worry about people calling you names. We're never told to go out and win conversations, are we? We're told not, we don't have to win arguments. Our job is to present the truth. We need to be able to stand up with God's word here and not be ashamed when we use his word. And how about this one? No human can confidently state they know God does not exist. To do so would mean they'd have to know everything, wouldn't they? Give you a little graph. How many like graphics? Yeah. Some people like to use this side of the brain. Some people like to use this side of the brain. Some people just don't use it. We've met them. Let's say that uh, big circle there is all the knowledge in the universe. If you knew 1% of that, that would be an enormous amount. That means if you knew 1% of everything in the universe and you made the claim that God does not exist, you could be 99% wrong. You don't know everything in the universe. So no one can absolutely state they know God does not exist. They can say, I don't believe God exists, but they cannot be dogmatic about it. And what do we know about them? They already know God exists, don't they? We know that. They don't know it yet, but they know it. And they know God's moral law. What they're doing is willfully rejecting it. There's incident. There's, you know there's no empirical evidence for the origin of the universe? Where'd the matter come from? There's no empirical evidence. Again, that's observable and repeatable. There's no observable evidence, repeatable evidence, for the origin of stars and galaxies. No one's ever seen a star form. I know what they say in the textbooks. They come up with all these extravagant arguments for how stars form. Get these great big gas and dust clouds rotate around and around and around. And as they rotate around, they gravitation and collapse inward and eventually form a new star. You know what the technical term for that is? Baloney. Because <laughs> we know from repeated experiments in laboratories, when you get a gas and dust and rotate it around and around, it will begin to gravitation and collapse inward due to the pressure. But as it gets more and more dense, gets more and more collapsed in there, it generates heat pressure, which is always stronger than the gravity and causes that cloud to expand outward. That's based on observable science. So there's no known way how all these stars got out there. It's all speculation. There's no observable evidence for how life began. We can't even create a single biological protein in the laboratory, so don't even talk about DNA, RNA, ribosomes, organelles. That gets you excited when I said terms like that. 
There's always one or two people like that. <laughs> Love that biology stuff. So we can't even get a protein, let alone anything else. The diversity of different life forms. We've never observed that either. You know what fish produce? Fish. You know what elephants produce? Elephants. Bacteria produce bacteria. That's all we ever observe. We observe varieties when kind, but never one creature creating another kind. Here's a big one. You know the dinosaurs just suddenly appear in the fossil record with no real transitions leading up to them? You look at all the textbooks, they have all this diversity of life, and all of a sudden the dinosaurs are there, and there's nothing leading up to them. You don't even see these transitions in the museums. You might see one alleged transition. You know what it looks like? A dinosaur. Sorry, 100% reptile. They don't have the transitions leading up to the dinosaurs. How about for us? All this hoopla about all these alleged transitions leading up to humans, there's not that much there, folks. It's all based on a lot of uh, artistic uh, license there. That's what we see in the textbooks, pictures drawn by artists. But there is no absolute proof anywhere for human evolution. And they have no absolute proof this Earth is billions of years old, because all those dating techniques, we refer to them as radiometric dating techniques, are all based on assumptions. And over and over again, we've shown that those assumptions are wrong. So there's no absolute proof of an old Earth either. So what do they really have? Faith. So we don't have anything to be afraid of if they bring up the science. So have scientists proven the Bible false? Absolutely not. Our first statement is what? Without a greater God, nothing could exist. And that's still true today. It's not outdated. So that's our authority. God created all things. True science always agrees with God's word. Ooh, let's get, here's the number one challenge now. You ready for the number one challenge against Christianity? It's called the problem of evil. This is the number one challenge. <clears throat> And we need to train every high schooler how to answer this. Even junior hires, we need to train how to answer this question. Because <clears throat> we can train them to do that, and they can understand this. They can be wonderful witnesses to their peers. If God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? I'm going to take this in two parts. First of all, we need to understand what is evil. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about how to answer the four-part challenge from the atheist. So how to define good and evil? Good. Whatever conforms to the will of God. Luke 18, 19. Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Let's talk about hot and cold. <coughs> we kind of tend to, during the winter months, it's cold outside. That's not a good statement. That's not an accurate scientific statement. You know why it's not accurate? Because you can't measure cold. You can't measure cold. Did that just mess everybody up? See, the temperature of an object is really measured by the heat energy it has. If something has less heat energy, it's going to appear cooler. If it's got more heat energy, it's going to appear warmer. It's the heat energy. That's what we're measuring. <coughs> In other words, how do, what do you mean by heat? We, energy, we have a particle moving. The faster that particle moves, the, more inter, the hotter things are going to be. <coughs> oh, thank you. I just put it down there so I can knock it over. <laughs> okay. Now really knock it over. <coughs> okay. Hot and cold. How can this popsicle feel cold when cold does not exist? Well, easy answer. Your body temperature is warmer than that popsicle. And when you touch that popsicle, there's a transfer of heat energy into the, to the popsicle. Why? Let me give an illustration here. Parents, grandparents, did you ever watch your teenager, son or daughter, open up the refrigerator, look inside for 10 minutes, and you finally said, close the door, you're letting all the cold air out? If you made that statement, you scarred your children for life because that's an unscientific statement to make. Hot always flows to cold. You're letting the hot air in. So you need to repent and say you're sorry to your children. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So that's exactly what's happening. When you touch the popsicle, there's a transfer of heat from your finger to the popsicle. So you're losing heat energy, so you have the cessation of feeling cold. So then, what is evil? Let's talk about, remember we've got hot and cold now. What is evil? You can't create evil because evil doesn't exist as a created entity. Ooh, that's something different. Why? Evil is not the presence of something material. It, tell, it requires something material to carry it out. But it, evil itself is not the material. Evil is the absence of goodness and the righteousness of God. So that's what evil is. It's the absence of something. Just like cold is what? The absence of heat energy. It's the same principle. So what's the definition of evil? Absence of God's goodness. Evil, that which is contrary to the revealed will of God. So evil is not an entity in itself. It's the absence of doing good, God's will. The same as hot and cold. So that's the first part. Now we understand what good and evil is. So responding to the believer. How can you call God good when he killed men, women, and children? Just read the Old Testament. He wiped out whole cities. Everybody. Men, women, and children. How can your God be good when he does that? Well, we're answering the believer. First statement is, as a believer, you're asking the wrong question. Believer, you're asking the wrong question. When I hear questions like that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, maybe they really don't understand who our God is. And that's true in many cases. They really don't understand who God is. Here's what they should be asking. The correct question is, why does a holy and righteous God, who knows what I have done and thought, allow me to live? That's the correct question. It's not as God, evil, we kill people here and there. The real question is, we're sinners. What do we all deserve? Death. Right on the spot, we deserve death. So the question is, why does he allow me to still live? Because he's also a God of mercy. And he chooses whom he'll have mercy on too, doesn't he? Right out of the book of Romans. So that's the question we really need to be asking. Why is he allowing me to live? Because what does the Bible tell us? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone deserves death. So understanding the challenge now. When the non-believer does it, it's an argument about morality, absolutes, or moral relativism. The fact that evil exists is not about God's existence at all, is it? It's about his character. So they usually ask this question for the wrong reason. It has nothing to do with God's existence. It has everything to do with his character. So responding to the unbeliever, here's your options. Pretend you didn't hear the challenge. There's a lot of Christians right there today trying to ignore that question. Call up your pastor. I find a lot of pastors don't know this one either. Tell them it's a mystery. We don't know all God's ways. They're, they're mysterious. It's not a good answer, folks. It's correct in one sense, but it's not a good answer. Or we can apply 1 Peter 3.15 says we're commanded to have a ready answer. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, we're told to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what we want to do tonight. So responding to the unbeliever, a clarification question. What is wrong with God killing people, and what is your standard for making that claim? Whoa, that's a pretty interesting one. <laughs> you, you claim God killed people, what's wrong with that? And what's your standard for making that claim it's wrong? Now what have we done? What have we just done in the whole conversation now? They challenged me. Now who's on the defense now? They are. How many like, how many like to win here? Now, this is not the purpose of apologetics, but I like to win. If I'm out running or things, I like to win. Second place is what? First lose, First lose right. <laughs> Unfortunately, it happened a lot of times to me. <laughs> so, I've challenged them now. They made a claim. In other words, they put something on the table now. 
I'm going to hold him accountable. That's why we don't want to start off by giving all these answers. Clarify the issue. What do they mean by wrong? What do they mean by this is evil? So the challenge is a conclusion based on some body of a standard of what is good and what is not good. I'd like to know what that is. What is their standard for evaluating what's good and what's not good? Well, if we look at absolute morality, how you decide right from wrong? Well, if God created us, then he has the right to choose what's right and wrong, doesn't he? But if he didn't create it, create everything, then we get to make up our own rules, don't we? And what that means is, who's ever in power makes the rules. Sounds like America today, doesn't it? We've abandoned God's rules for morality. So, four possible responses the non-believer can have. There's varieties of each of these, but basically there's four possible responses they can have. Let's look at these. Response number one, if the standard moral code is based upon personal opinion. Well, it's just my opinion and it's wrong. Well, do you know what? Everybody has opinions. Then how can we condemn murderers and rapists and burglars? Because don't they have opinions? Should be nobody in any prisons because they had the opinion that was a good thing to do. So that's not a very good answer, is it? My opinion is you shouldn't live in that wealthy house. I'm going to take it from you. That watch you have on, I'm going to take it. I don't think you should have that. That's my opinion. I think we should all have the same level of income. And I don't care how hard you work. We should all have the same level of income. It's, that's social justice and uh, critical race theory. The, in other words, it doesn't matter how hard you work. But if somebody doesn't work hard, you work hard, you all get the same pay. That doesn't sound like uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Critical race theory goes against our preamble there. Response number two. Anybody recognize any of those people there at the bottom? Pol Pot killed millions. Idi Amin killed millions. Stalin killed tens of millions. And the Hitler responsible for tens of millions of deaths. So if the standard moral code is based upon what benefits society, and all those people thought it benefited society, then statement like the society was evil are meaningless because different cultures have different conventions. Some societies today say it's okay to chop your hands off if you're caught stealing. Or if you don't believe like us, we'll chop your head off. You can't condemn them because that's part of their culture, isn't it? So that's not a real good answer. It's not a universal answer. How about response number three? If the standard moral code is based on the laws of society, have the laws in this country always been good? Absolutely not, because we had some laws that condoned slavery, didn't we? We've had other bad laws. We have laws today that say we can slaughter children. Unborn children, we can kill them. We can have many different moral codes because different societies have different laws. And we're also assuming all laws are good, and they're not, necessarily. So that's not a good answer. The only other response they can have, number four, if the standard moral code is based on what makes people feel good. Some people, you know what makes them feel good to hurt other people? People do that. It makes them feel good. They get a high by harming other people. We can have many different moral codes. People have different feelings. Marines don't have feelings. We just shoot. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Everybody has feelings, folks. And everybody has different sense of feelings. So the response allows for murder, stealing, torture, and rape. None of those are universal standards. So if this is what the non-believer has. Personal opinion, benefit society, law society, feelings. Every one of them falls short of a universal standard. <clears throat> Basically, it comes out to this. Who's ever in power makes the rules for that society. Somebody new comes to power, they can make a new set of rules. So there is no universal standard whatever. So that's all their answers. Whoever is in control makes the rules. That's the only thing they can come up with. So let's provide a solution now. God is all good. God is all powerful, but evil exists. How can those two go together? How can an all God good allow evil to continue? Well, they forget a fourth part. God has a reason for allowing evil to exist. 
He has a reason for allowing it to continue to exist. So why is he allowed to continue? God is purposely delaying elimination of evil in order to allow more time for people to come to him. The parable of the wheat and the tares. God is giving us time. What a wonderful God we have. He's giving us time for more and more people to come to him. He's gathering all his people. So he's giving us more time there. God is long-suffering, wants all to come to a saving knowledge. He knows not everybody's going to come, but he's waiting for everybody to come. And then God will one day do away with all evil, won't he? That's the last book in the Bible. He's going to do away with all evil. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And guess what? Everything's going to be perfect again, just the way it started. And if it took him millions of years to do it in, in Genesis, will it also take him millions of years to do it in Revelation? So the solution, folks, that they need to hear is what? The gospel. God is the creator of all things. His creation was perfect. How do we know it was perfect? He, tell, he told us it was perfect. Meaning there's no death before sin. Then man sinned, and all have sinned since then. God, in his great love for us, provided a solution by paying the penalty for our sins. What a wonderful God we have. If you were... Let me ask a question. This, you can do these kind of things. You, see, you get some of this off the Internet, too. You can see some of these. YouTube has some wonderful speakers out there, too. Don't watch all of them, though, but there's some good ones. If you do something morally wrong, should you have to pay a penalty? Such as murder, rape, burglary. Is that wrong? Should you have to pay a penalty for that? Okay. Have you ever done anything wrong? Yes. So you're all guilty, aren't you? Everyone was guilty. But if you had to go to court because of something you did, and the judge looks at you and said, you're free to go if somebody's offered to pay your penalty, would you accept it? If you're guilty, you definitely will, won't you? And we're all guilty. And that's the analogy you can use right there. We're all guilty, and God offered us to pay the penalty for what we've done wrong. And that's the kind of conversation I'm going to get with this person. You know why? Because they don't understand Christianese all the time. I've met people, they don't understand what sin is. They don't know these buzzwords, folks. And then you can continue on to the gospel. That Jesus Christ came down to this planet, suffered and died a horrible death on the cross for us, was raised from the dead, and paid our penalty. And then the last challenge. So that's how we do this. What's our big statement we like to use? Without a creator God, nothing could exist. Keep that one in your hip pocket. The last one. The Bible's outdated. Well, let's look at that. First question I have before I give any answers, what makes you believe the Bible's outdated? I want to find out why they believe that. Put their cards on the table. Then I'll know better how to answer the question. Rather than just blurting off, well, we can talk about archaeology, we can talk about all this. No. Ask questions. Find out why they're asking this question. Let's talk about the God of history. You know, when we talk about this, there's only two things we can believe. God and not God. Those are the only two possibilities. How we think God here. God and not God. I've never had anybody come up with a third way. Either God created everything or there was no God that created everything. And it starts off, in the beginning, God. What does that tell us? God exists. In other words, I'm building my case here now. Now that I know what they, why they don't believe, I'm going to build a case. Now, not every answer is going to be the same because they might put different cards on the table, different reasons for not believing the Bible. This. And God created. There's your verb. That's an action verb. How many remember your English? English? How many remember prepositions? Object of prepositions. You forgot those. Probably a good thing. Give you nightmares. <laughs> Why did he create the heavens and the earth? And I'm going to go through and say, this is still reliable. I'm going to choose that there's God over not God. Why? Because I think that's relevant. What I'm going to show them is the Bible is relevant today. They think it's outdated. I'm going to take the approach. I'm going to show you it's relevant. 
Because the only answer you can have how anything exists is God. He has to exist. Because without a creator God, nothing can exist. That's relevant today. Because they can't challenge that. In the beginning, God, He created the heavens and the earth. God knows the end from the beginning. And to be creator of all things, He must be omniscient and omnipotent. I decided to put those there, come, I pronounce them. What do, what do they mean? He's all powerful and He's all knowing. He declares His word to be true, meaning it's relevant. And then, the Bible has never had to change and is still relevant today. Everyone is a sinner, still relevant. We need a Savior, that's still relevant. Jesus is the only way to heaven, that's still relevant. What am I doing again? Gospel. Getting to the gospel. I'm showing him that this, especially this, is relevant. Because they know God exists. They know his moral law. And we need to let them know that. Okay, we got back there, we went backwards there, so we have that. Then use a comparical science, observable and repeatable. Could you tell me why the Bible is outdated? Now I'm challenging them. I gave them an answer. In other words, I wanted to make sure I had time to use the power of God's Word, the Gospel. Now I'm going to challenge them. Show me any evidence, give me any evidence why you think it's outdated. Now they have to put the cards down. And what do we know from the beginning? They have no answer for where the matter came from. They have no answer for the origin of life. No answer where the dinosaurs came from. So who's really not relevant? You see, we've been snookered into believing that we have to defend the Bible all the time. We need to learn how to turn this around, use tactics, and ask them questions. The Bible contains an accurate history of the world, the origin of nations, Where'd the nations come from? Well, the Bible has that answer. The origin of languages. That's still a mystery to people. Where'd all these languages come from? And the earliest languages seem to be very complex. Well, we know where they came from, called the Tower of Babel. Wars and kings. The Bible talks about a lot about wars and kings. The Bible is not a science book, but when it addresses matters of science, it's accurate in every case. Talks about the origin of the universe. Well, there goes that question again. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. The origin of stars, the origin of life, the diversity of life. God created everything after its kind. Can you show me one instance where one kind actually produced a completely different kind? Geology and the fossil record. You know where we find most all fossils in this world? This might surprise you. In sediments laid down by water. What does that suggest? There was a big flood. Almost all fossils are found in sediments laid down by water. We find fossil graveyards where we find all kinds of different creatures all buried and mangled together in sediments laid down by water. That doesn't seem to support evolution at all, folks. The origin of humans and the age of the earth. The Bible gives a pretty clear age, approximate age, around 6,000 years. There's good science also to support a very young earth, which has been censored out of our school systems. So the Bible has answers for difficult questions about life. Why are we here? Evolution doesn't answer that other than uh, you're an accident. That's not very meaningful, you're an accident. Why is there death and suffering? The Bible has answers for that, it's called sin. What's the purpose of life? The Bible has answers for that. Evolution just says whatever you make of it. And what happens when we die? Well, according to evolution, that's the end of your existence. That's sad, folks. We have something better to offer. Once you're being taught this for 12 years through our public education system, government schools, no wonder we have students, not if they're unashamed to go shoot people, then turn the gun on themselves and shoot themselves. Because to them, they think that's the end of their existence. What's this, what a sad thing is, because they're going to face God one day, and there's no second chances. We need to reach this next generation. We're not doing a very good job of it. Matter of fact, we're doing a miserable job of it. Over 60% of our youth are walking away from the church today. Only about 4% or less of the youth in this country have a biblical worldview. And the trend is going down. Every generation, less and less of our youth are having a biblical worldview. We've got to do something. 
and issues about morality and sin. The Bible has answers for those. And how do you get to heaven? The Bible has answers for that also. And there's only one way, through Jesus Christ. The Bible is unique. It's different from every other religion book in the world. Every other religion in the world says you've got to do something called works. The Bible says, no, it's been done, the cross and the resurrection. That's what differentiates Christianity from every other religion in the world. It's called do and done. Does it make Christianity exclusive? Yes, it does. Because it says there's only one way. Don't be ashamed to say we're exclusive because we have the truth. All through history, though, people tried to ban the Bible, burn it, and outlaw it. There is even countries today that are outlawing it and burning it. They've tried to add books and subtract books from the Bible, the missing Gospels. They've told us it's not even relevant today. Time Magazine, is the Bible fact or fiction? We read the article and it says it's just fiction. They've tried to compromise God's Word by putting the Big Bang and billions of years into the Bible, where it's not, that's not found anywhere in Scripture. And they've tried to mock God's Word. You know what the track record for is, all this? All those people who tried to burn it, ban it, outlaw, outlaw God's Word and mock it, you know what the track record is? They're all dead, and God's Word remains unchanged. That's the track record, folks. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. We can take that to the bank, folks. God will have His Word remain. It's just, it's, are you willing to go out there and be one of his servants to help other people understand that the truth is God does exist. He's the creator and he's our savior. So the conclusion, four challenges, four answers. Did we have to touch much on science? No, we didn't have to go into much of science at all. I'm not saying rule out science. We have courses that we teach. Uh, we're gonna do a lot on Saturday, give you the basics that you don't have to be a scientist. We show you things like, the origin of life, we should never lose that discussion. We should never lose the discussion on dinosaurs. We show you how to do things like that. Just sixth graders will understand what we have to say. And what we're doing here at a Creation Training Initiative, we have kind of partnered with the, how many have heard of the Institute for Creation Research? Located in Dallas, Texas. They are a wonderful group of research scientists. They've been around since the 70s. And they're the ones supplying a lot of original research that we can use. And it all points to a creator God. Wonderful group of scientists there. We've partnered with them, and uh, together we put out quality education now. We travel around the country doing good quality education. And we have a new project we're working with now called Sec the Second Timothy 2.2 Education Project. What does Second Timothy 2.2 say? The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. In other words, Paul's talking to Timothy, and Paul says to Timothy, now that I've trained you, you go out and do what I just did. You train others how to teach. It's called discipleship. That's something we've lost in the church, discipleship. And that's what I mean. We're a small ministry. We don't need to be big. If we get big, we're not doing our job. Our job is to train people all over this country how to speak and teach on biblical creation, how to defend their faith, so that they can go back to their church, and then the church owns it. And we have a plan, in a five-year plan. In five years, we can train 15,000 youth to be able to defend their faith. We're not just talking about doing online training. That's good, but it's not near as good. We're not just talking about coming to a presentation, hearing it. We're talking about actually equipping them so they can verbally answer challenges and give the gospel. 15,000 in five years. We have a brochure out there. On one of the ends of the tables, we have a brochure. Looks like this, pick it up if you're interested in this. We're trying to raise funding to do this, folks. We're supplying the teachers to train the teachers. That's part of the equation, but we, this takes financing. We don't need millions of dollars to do this. We're not doing any building projects. We don't need that. We operate out of our house, as uh, other people will. But we're gonna travel over the country, and we're gonna train people, put on classes, and for, to be a teacher for of our courses, what you have to do, you have to, I either come to you or you come to us and stand in front of me for three days, and I work with you, coaching how to teach. Three personal days, just how to teach. Then we set you in our courses, take our course, then we start co-teaching. And then eventually you can take the course. 
And we want people in churches all over this country who can do these things. Well, we want our youth especially. I'm tired here. We're losing over 60%. It's time to stop complaining, and it's time to get on the battlefield and start doing some training. No more complaining. Let's, let's go to action now. We're on the battlefield. Let's get there. The war's there. Let's get on the battlefield. Also, we have a newsletter. If you want to sign up for the newsletter, keep track of what's going. This next year, in August, we're holding our five-day training course again. This most unique course you'll ever see. Five straight days of teaching, 8.30 in the morning till 8.30 in the evening. It's going to be a Ridge Christ Conference Center in North Carolina, a wonderful place just outside Asheville, North Carolina. We pay half your cost. $590, that pays for the five-day course, five nights of lodging, and 15 meals. The actual price for each person that comes is over $1,000 to us closer to $1,200. We only charge $590. So we have that. Uh, also in June next year at the Institute of Grace Research Discovery Center, the museum, we're holding a four-day Christian Educators Conference, our second one down there. We held one this year. We had people from 14 different states come there. So that's what we're doing. And if you want to support this ministry, we need your support to do this. Again, we're supplying the teachers. We'll do all the training, but we need finances to do this. So that's our ministry, and I'm going to stop there, hand it over to Heinz, and he's going to answer every question you've ever thought of.